Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. This week on To the Contrary, the pandemic's impact on women and diverse people as it relates to increasing harassment at work and making global gender equality less attainable. Then, Asian and African American women, allies fighting discrimination and violence. Bay. Welcome to To the Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. Up first, equality, harassment, and anti-Asian discrimination. Working remotely is increasing the amount of gender and racial harassment experienced by technology workers. That according to Project Include, a group that advocates for diversity in the tech industry. The survey found women of color are most likely to report increased hostility and harassment. What's to blame? Researchers suggest people working longer hours, blurring the lines between work and home life and more private conversations taking place. Also this week, the World Economic Forum reported it will take nearly 136 years for women to reach global gender equality. That's up a full generation from last year's estimate of 100 years. The forum uses economic participation, opportunity, education, health, and political empowerment as factors to make its calculations. Iceland was found to be the most gender equal country and the U.S. moved up 23 slots this year. With us today are former U.S. Representative Donna Edwards, Patrice Anwuka of Independent Women's Voices, Amanda Turkle, Washington Bureau Chief for the Huffington Post, and Republican strategist, and Stone. So Donna Edwards, how could women's gains have been so illusory as to be lost in one year of a pandemic? You know, I think it's been fascinating. I mean, I think more than 3 million women have lost their, uh, their jobs, their income, uh, not participating in the economy. And part of that is the part of the economy that women participate in. Uh, which is, you know, much more vulnerable in this economic environment. Uh, and so that's why it's going to be so important that gender equity is really part of the Biden agenda coming forward to recover these jobs and to gain them and sustain them. Well, I don't see how any administration, even that of a woman, could be more gender progressive than the Biden administration. I mean, I think he's actually gone out so far to the left on gender equity that he stands to alienate some of the independents he might want to um, lure to vote for him if he runs for re-election. Re Do you agree or not? No, I mean, a lot of those independents, frankly, are suburban women and they're women who've lost their jobs or whose jobs are vulnerable. I think that this is a win-win uh, for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris because uh, women want to participate in the economy. And the question is how, and this new infrastructure plan, I think is so important to engage women in a part of the economy that they've been left out for so long. This is a win for the Biden administration. Ann Stone, your thoughts? Well, I think that you're gonna find women coming back into the economy in different ways. A lot of them, once they went uh, back home because of schools being closed, they had uh, obligations with children. They found it easier to work from home. And before the pandemic, uh, we know that women-owned businesses were contributing to a large number of the new jobs being created, but they were doing it a lot of it home-based. And I think you're gonna see that happen again as the need for services increases. Women are going to find creative ways to be able to stay at home and create new jobs. All right, but a lot of the, the women's jobs who were lost and why the pandemic hit so heavily on women workers is because women are the majority of low wage workers. So they were 
waitressing or that's you know, part being, of it. Being clerks sure. in in a Walmart or that sort of thing. This infrastructure bill is all about guess what? Construction jobs. Should the Biden administration be making a huge effort to train women for some of those jobs? Well, not only should they do that, but there are women's associations in construction and building that should get a lot more support. And I've spoken in front of these groups a lot about women's history, and they're very energetic, very creative. Uh, McKissick, Cheryl McKissick, who owns her family owns the, the um, oldest uh, African-American construction company in the country, is an advisor to Kamala Harris. And she also was involved with the Women's History Museum uh, along with me. And I think, you know, reaching out to people like that to help bring others in. And again, there are very strong associations for women in construction. They need support. They'll bring more people in. They'll help guide the administration on how to train. Amanda Turkle, first of all, welcome back. Thank you. And secondly, your thoughts on what needs to be done to get women who come back into the economy, one would hope, into higher paying jobs this time. Well, I wanted to comment on the, the Biden infrastructure plan. I mean, the majority of it is about roads and bridges and what we traditionally think of as traditional uh, construction jobs. But not all of it is. It also would spend about $400 billion uh, to care for elderly and people with disabilities. Um, and those, you know, again, as we've been talking about, those sort of service care jobs are ones where women are really sort of the dominant force. And there are already criticisms of some uh, more moderate, some Republicans saying like these sorts of things don't really belong in an infrastructure bill. They're not traditional infrastructure and maybe they won't vote for it. Uh, but I think if we're interested in making sure that we have, you know, human infrastructure in addition to the traditional infrastructure, and getting women more involved, these sorts of investments are necessary. All right, and your thoughts, Patrice? Well, you know, I, I worry about uh, some of the things in the Biden plan, particularly when it comes to uh, the reg new, potentially new regulations that would make it difficult to be an independent contractor. These are particularly jobs, flexible jobs, work from home jobs, work from anywhere at any time jobs that I think a lot of women, as um, Anne was referring to, have found that they've been able to stay attached to the labor force. Uh, but that would be erased because of this jobs plan. I also recognize, and I think a lot of conservatives do as well, that uh, it's a it's a big, pretty big price tag. Number one, uh, with very with not too many details on how it's going to be paid, and then why not take some of these individual big policy areas like how do we work on childcare or caring uh, types of jobs, and 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 separate them out and have separate discussions about those. Uh, but when you talk about getting women back into the workforce after this, we also have to recognize a lot of women don't recognize don't know the choices they have and the monetary um, benefits that are attached to them. And even if they do, maybe they make the choice to choose those jobs for fulfillment or for flexibility. And we have to respect that at the end of the day as well. All right, now let's transition to the report that came out about the tech industry, which was of course uh, spearheaded by Ellen Powell. Um, and she had, she's the famous one who I believe was at Reddit and, and then was in Silicon Valley venture capital and got fired and sued for discrimination. One of the things her findings show is that because of working from home, people aren't privy to as many private conversations um, that may include sexual harassment, state, sexually harassing statements or uh, discrimination that because when you're on a Zoom call and that's the only contact you have with your colleagues, but your boss is still talking to them on the phone, let's say more than to the women. Um, how in the heck does somebody monitor for that in an increasingly technologically based economy? Who's thought, who's thought, Amanda? Sure, um, right, obviously, I mean, you don't want your employer uh, spying on your work conversations, although they have the ability to do that on some platforms like Slack, which I actually find pretty troublesome. But, you know, I think that's exactly right. I mean, think of it, uh, you know, I, I'm chatting one on one with people either on the phone, through Slack, through email, through other, you know, messaging services. 
Um, it's less of, you know, coming over to someone's desk, talking with them in a place where everyone could see or being in sort of one of those glass meeting rooms. And also not only that, you know, the hours are longer. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I'm often working during the day and taking care of my kid in the evening and then signing back on until working until midnight. And the day just never ends. The, the a line between your work and your home life is completely blurred and that can create some issues. And when you are working from home and you feel less connected to your coworkers, there can be questions too of, well, who do I go to, to report some of this? You know, am I just being, you know, am I imagining it? Uh, should I make a fuss? You know, th th you don't necessarily have as many resources as you would in an office place. But some of what the report said is that technology programs need to catch up and show how, um, how, uh, how people are interacting when the, the women aren't around, that sort of thing. Is that possible? Does technology make that possible? Well, it's so interesting that you mentioned that because I think one of the things that occurs is that um, we all know that um, these social platforms actually give people permission to speak and to act in a way that um, they could not possibly do when um, they're one-on-one -on -one or in human interaction in an office place. And one of the things that um, was maybe surprising is that the platforms have not captured the ability um, to hold on to those private chats that are happening. And so if somebody is acting inappropriately in a private chat, you have no way of showing that to, even if you have a boss who's receptive, you have no way of showing that uh, to him or her. And I think this is where uh, these platforms, that technology capability is there and they need to implement it. Well, I would just push what, back and- Go ahead. Well, I, would, I would just push back and say that that opens up some, uh, I mean, you actually do. For example, in a chat, you could screenshot the chats and go back and save those if you really feel that, that the, the conversation is inappropriate. Now, that, that, that doesn't work when you're on a telephone call. That's, I, I don't know what you do then. But I do think it opens up privacy issues uh, that have been raised on this panel as well. So, I mean, while I, while I, I respect the, 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 the desire to see uh, tech platforms uh, be able to allow you to capture uh, conversations and, and things like that. I mean, that can open the door to other issues from a privacy perspective that I think would raise more issues. I mean, that could be, that could be harm, harmful for a lot more people than, uh, than, than I think we're thinking about. Right, my thoughts exactly, uh, Patrice. Doesn't this sort of harken back to the 50s and 60s with, uh, you know, the FBI and before that Hoover bugging people's homes. Uh, I was just reading about uh, somebody who, in somebody's obituary, that this person was being spied on by the government and when he or she passed and new people bought the home and renovated it, they found all kinds of bugs in the wall. <laughs> so aren't we going, you know, to monitor that kind of thing, isn't there a trade-off? And where no, no, no. I think personally, but I think personally uh, to be able to do that. And I think it's complicated when you're in the middle of a meeting and somebody is private chatting you and you're trying to pay attention uh, to then be able to, uh, to capture that. Um, and not for the platforms themselves to monitor what's going on and turn it over to the uh, to the corporation, I think that's ridiculous. And if you're, you know, if you're on a telephone call in many states, and I'm in in my state, I can record that because I'm on the phone call. Um, but in in other ways, you can't really do the same thing when you're interacting in the middle of a meeting uh, on the platform. Okay, and one last question about this: I would think, on some level, tell me I'm wrong. But if you're not interacting with each other in person, uh, anywhere near as much as you used to be in the office, isn't that less time for people who would harass women sexually or assault them that they have fewer opportunities in this situation if everyone's working from home? Yes or no? I think, I think there is some truth to that. But the other problem is, we know, and we know because we have examples of guys showing up for these Zoom meetings with no pants on and stuff like that, that there's too much casual attitude towards these meetings. And that's for the people in the charge of these meetings and the corporations setting etiquette rules and setting some standards for when they get on the phone so that even though the 
the the facilitation of the meeting may be more casual, that they're expected to act and behave. You know, Golden Globes, um, after what happened there, you know, the Oscar said, you're going to come dress this time, because if you set the rules, that's going to help as well. The second thing I would offer is women need other skills that we don't normally get. Uh, to be able to compete more effectively in this more relaxed atmosphere, one of which is the art of negotiation. I mean, I am shocked constantly at how women are just unaware of how to stand up for themselves. And it's not something they're taught, and it's something men get at their father's knee that we still don't. So there's a lot of other things like that corporations can be doing, that nonprofits can be doing to equip women with skills that will better able them to compete in these kind of atmospheres from gender equality to building alliances. Reports of hate crimes against Asian Americans, especially women, are on the rise. Just this week, a man was arrested for assaulting an Asian American woman in New York City in broad daylight. Last month, six Asian women were murdered in Atlanta. Many Americans, particularly Black female activists, have come out to rally in support of Asian American and Pacific Islanders. Activists say Black and Asian Americans are natural allies, sharing a history of oppression and discrimination. They also say stereotyping has consequences from the fetishization of Asian women to the trope of the angry Black woman. How do Asian American women and African American women experience uh, race discrimination and gender discrimination differently? Oh boy, <laughs> that's quite a question. <laughs> In two um, seconds or less, I see it. <laughs> um, you know, I think that you know, I feel like, uh, you know, racial equality is often portrayed as a zero sum game. You know, Asians are getting ahead and that's at the expense of the Latino community or African Americans. And that's not actually how racial equality works. And for too long, different people of color and different communities have been pitted against each other. And I feel like now increasingly, um, you know, through the Black Lives Matter movement, through other movements that are going on, people are finally realizing that, you know, that that's not true. You know, we can all lift each other up. And you're seeing, you know, Asian Americans, Latinos, other people were all, you know, supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. You're seeing now with this violence against uh, Asian Americans, uh, you are seeing people of all races and all different, you know, it's not just Asian Americans calling this out and, and stopping the hate. And so this intersectionality, I think is great and hopefully it continues. Donna, how do you see um, women of color who are Asian and women of color who are African backgrounds uh, building alliances? And is this something new or has it been going on for quite some time and just the murders of Asian American women um, bringing it to light. Look, I, th I actually think that we're in a moment that's probably been going on for the last couple of years where uh, what in Amanda describes as its intersectionality is happening on the ground where communities are uniting and where, you know, Asian Americans, Latinos, uh, African-Americans, we realize that our struggles are very, very similar. They may not be the same, but they're similar enough um, to enable us to support each other. And I think it's gratifying to see that there were over 3,800 uh, allied um, marches and events in support of Asian-Americans and against Asian-American violence. And um, the multitude of the types of people, uh, young, old, black, white, Asian, Latino, um, at these at these events, and that is uh, going to be a new day uh, for people who want to oppress any uh, category of people. And Stone, your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are: I'm glad to see people working together on this. And for too long, uh, Asian Americans, especially the elder. Uh, Asian Americans have been stereotyped as being too weak and too vulnerable, and that's why they become targets, especially Asian American women, that they're submissive and that they won't fight back. And there's but, been some. But you and yeah. I both know, because we go back, way back in the women's movement, 20, 30 years ago, there were now would have news conferences and, and include uh, African American, the AAPI, Asian American Pacific Islanders groups. Um, so this is not new, right? And there is there has in coalition. You are correct, and they but there hasn't been enough of that 
recently. This hopefully is going to bring that back where everybody, and it should be all races working together because that's the only way this is going to be solved. You know, uh, elevating one or two versus another and tearing one down or whatever, that doesn't help anybody. But getting everybody to work together is going to be uh, key going forward. And I'm glad to see uh, that first steps are happening. Uh, Patrice, uh, tough question, I know, but um, do you feel as close to Asian American women in terms of fighting against whatever um, racism you may have faced as you do to African American women or as you do with African American women? Uh, I think it's a it's interesting because um, you know I as an immigrant black woman I actually understand the, the discrimination against Asian uh, Asian people in general particularly in the educational field and what I mean by that is there's been uh, kind of a discrimination against high performing. Uh, people of color coming from African nations, coming from the Caribbean nations, and coming for, or and coming from Asian backgrounds, uh, because the assumption is that those are high performing from stable, strong families, two parent households who are economically actually doing better, and so certain spots in 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 elite universities, for example, should be reserved for those who uh, whose backgrounds have been discriminated against through slavery. So I mean, I think it's 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 uh, there's more nuance to this conversation than I think uh, is being had here. I absolutely unite with my brothers and my sisters, you know, of every race and color against against violence and gender violence in particular. But I'm, I'm curious to see how this is going to bear out when you move into other more contentious issues where you have seen um, that some races, even within the black race and uh, Hispanics versus blacks or Asians and, and blacks have been, you know, uh, treated very differently. Uh, in efforts to reverse discrimination from the past. And I think that is what is going to be the next step. I think we're also seeing a broader recognition. I saw this a lot after the recent election that, you know, speaking about the Asian community, the Asian community, you know, is very different. If you are, you know, if you're from, uh, if you're Korean American, if you're Chinese American, Japanese, you know, Filipino, you know, Indian American. Right. There are a lot of different experiences and, you know, uh, a lot of Asian women or Asian men, you know, it's assumed that you're just Asian. You know, the number of times I have put, had people speak, uh, try to speak Chinese to me or assume I'm Chinese or Japanese or speak gibberish and just uh, throw something at me. Not, not not physically, but, you know, some sort of uh, comment my way, um, you know, the, these communities have very different experiences. And we learned that after the 2020 election where it was talked about the Latino vote, the Hispanic vote, you know, Cuban Americans really, really different than recent immigrants from Mexico, for example. And we saw that in their voting patterns. And I think that people are starting to recognize this and there will be more efforts to understand the individual communities and sort of their perceptions. I think it's really important to recognize the difference between now and even 30 or 40 years ago with the women's movement is that the leader leadership on these issues is actually coming from women of color, whereas, you know, previously uh, women were, sure, um, highlighted at press conferences, but really didn't serve in the leadership of the movement. And today, these women leaders are stepping up all across the board in every single community um, to lead their own fights. Okay, and, and I want to ask, um, Anne, do you think white Americans have an impression, for example, and I'm not sure if this, of the data, I don't know what they are, but that, for example, Asian Americans seem to do way better in a higher education in getting into the best schools than African Americans. And so there's a difference there in um, educational opportunities, abilities to pay, et cetera, et cetera. I think there probably is some of that out there. And they also look at the difference in culture and in the Asian culture where the elders are really honored and there's such an emphasis on education throughout the culture is something, at least the impression that whites have. But I wanna tell you, I, one of the comments I'd forgotten to made er, earlier, if you go and you used to Google on Asian American history, Asian American women's history, you know what you got? Asian babes for sale. Oh and we're, talk God. we're talking about this is recently. Uh, it may even still be the case that's going to show up in the top five search on Asian American women's history. Uh, one of the things we did at the National Women's History Museum was to put uh, exhibits up so that would show up first as opposed to 
Asian babes for sale. When it's that pervasive on the internet and every place anybody would come for information, that's pretty bad. And that's something that still needs to be corrected. All right, and uh, again, Amanda, why don't we close out with you? What are the biggest gaps that need to be bridged between Asian American women and African American and Hispanic American women? You know, I think it's just increasingly being able to talk about your experiences, you know, put it out there in the public, um, you know, bust some of the myths that are out there and just be open and have a conversation about, you know, the different experiences, the commonalities. Um, and again, just to recognize that this is not a zero sum game. Uh, you know, it doesn't progress does not have to be at the expense of each other and sort of reinforcing that just um, fuels sort of the hierarchy that's been in place that's just not good for any any women, basically. All right, thank you all so much. This was fascinating. Uh, that's it for this edition. Please follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Please go to our PBS webpage, which is tothecontrary.org. And whether you agree or think, to the contrary, we'll see you next time. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. Be more PBS. <laughs>